Good afternoon. Welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. And a special uh, welcome to those watching live on our YouTube channel, and also welcome to our friends from C-SPAN. I'm Tom Nastic, public program producer for the National Archives. Today, our series of noontime book lectures continues with Picturing Frederick Douglass, an illustrated biography of the 19th century's most photographed American, with our special guest, John Stauffer. Before we get to today's program, I'd like to alert you to a, a couple of upcoming noontime lectures. On Wednesday, January 27th at noon, author Edward G. Lengel will be here to talk about his book, First Entrepreneur, How George Washington Built His and the Nation's Prosperity. And then on Tuesday, February 9th at noon, author Alondra Nelson will be joined by journalist Alelia Bundles to discuss Nelson's book, Social Life of DNA, Race, Reparations, and Reconciliation After the Genome. Book signings will follow both of these programs. To find out more about these and all of our public programs, please consult our monthly calendar of events in the theater lobby or visit us online at www.archives.gov. John Stauffer is a leading authority on anti-slavery, the Civil War era, social protest movements, and photography. He is a Harvard University professor of English and American Literature, American Studies, and African American Studies. He's the author of 19 books, two of which were national bestsellers. He's the author of more than 50 academic articles, and his essays have also appeared in Time, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The New Republic, and The Washington Post among other places. He is the editor of 21st Editions, has served as a consultant for the traveling exhibition War Slash Photography, and has co-curated an exhibition on Douglas and Melville at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. He has also advised three award-winning documentaries and has been a consultant for feature films, including Django Unchained and The Free State of Jones, which is based on his book, The State of Jones. Of picturing Frederick Douglass, Lincoln scholar Harold Holzer wrote, Quote, nothing less than a masterpiece in the fields of biography, African-American history, and not least of all, the neglected area of iconography, a riveting instant classic and a pure pleasure to behold. Following his talk and Q&A, he will be signing copies of his book, One Level Up, outside the archive store. Would you please help me in welcoming John Stauffer back to the National Archives? Thank you, Tom, for that very generous introduction. Can everyone hear me? If my voice flags, uh, just raise your hand. Normally it carries uh, quite well. I'll speak for about 45 minutes and then open it up for questions and answers. And I'll start with just giving you a sense of how I became interested in Douglas and photography. I've long been interested in Frederick Douglass. I first read him as a kid uh, in an earlier book, a dual biography of Douglass and Lincoln. Among other things, I argued that Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln are among the two greatest nonfiction writers in uh, the 19th century. And I still believe that. And before I went to graduate school, uh, I, st I was fascinated by how many different photographs uh, I saw a Frederick Douglass, and I started collecting uh, copies or files of them. And uh, two friends, Zoe Trod and Celeste Bernier, about six or seven years ago, approached me about a project on photography. And uh, I said, well, if I do one, I would love to see how many separate photographs there are of Douglass. I knew that there were writings by him on photography that were very important and said really do a book that for the first time highlights uh, the way in which Douglas understood the power of photography and saw it as a crucial aid in his reform work and that in a sense is what the book is about. Frederick Douglass was in love with photography. He was a great evangelist for this new medium, and he wrote more extensively on it than any peer. He frequented photographers' studios whenever he could, and he sat for his portrait. And as a result of this passion, he became the most photographed American in the 19th century. Now, what's the evidence for that? I'll tell it, I'll give you that in a second. Now, it may seem strange, if not implausible, to assert that a black man and former slave wrote more extensively on photography 
and sat for his portrait more frequently than any peer. But he did. He penned four separate talks on the medium, which is more than any other American at the time. And two of these talks are published for the first time in our book and are among, in my view, Douglas's greatest speeches. We have also identified 164 separate photographs of Douglas as defined by distinct poses rather than multiple copies of the same image or the same negative. By contrast, and here's the ranking, scholars have identified 155 separate photographs of George Custer, 128 of Red Cloud, 127 of Walt Whitman, and 126 of Lincoln. Now, U.S. Grant is actually a contender, but no one has published the corpus of Grant's photographs, and no one has counted up or analyzed those photographs. One eminent scholar, Harold Holzer, has estimated 150 separate photographs of Grant. So that's the evidence for Douglas as the most photographed American in the 19th century. Douglas's passion for photography has been largely ignored. He's best remembered as a brilliant writer and orator, a leading abolitionist, and the preeminent black leader of the 19th century who influenced virtually every other black leader of the 20th and 21st century. Scholars, including myself, have celebrated his relationship with President Lincoln. Douglas was the first black man to meet with and advise a U.S. president. He met and advised Lincoln three times in the White House uh, during the Civil War. And to give you a sense of how significant that was, the next time that a black man met with and advised a U.S. president on similar terms of equality was when Martin Luther King Jr. met with and advised Lyndon Johnson 12 times during the 1960s by my count. Douglas also met with every subsequent president until his death in 1895, and he was the first African American to receive a federal appointment requiring Senate approval. His three autobiographies, two of which were bestsellers, helped transform the genre and are still read today. Yet because his photographic passion has been almost completely forgotten, historians, critics, and all those who recognize Douglass's significance miss an important question. And that is, why would a man who truly devoted his life to ending slavery and racism and championing human rights be so in love with photography? There are four reasons for this. First, Douglas saw photography as a great democratic art. More than once, he praised Louis Daguerre, the co-founder of photography, by calling him the great discoverer of modern times. With Daguerre's invention, Douglas said, the humblest servant girl may now possess a picture of herself such as the wealth of kings could not purchase 50 years ago. Douglas and photography came of age together. He escaped from slavery on September 3, 1838, a year before Daguerre and Henry Ta Fox Talbot created the first forms of photography. Douglas began his career as an abolitionist orator in 1841, in other words, a public figure, just as technical improvements reduced exposure times and thus enabling the proliferation of daguerreotype portraits. And portraits are what really fueled the demand and the love of photography. They constituted over 90% of all images in the medium's first four decades. In other words, throughout the 19th century, almost until the end of the 19th century, 90% of all photographs were portraits. Douglas first sat for a fo photograph, a daguerreotype owned by Greg French, a friend of mine in Boston, around 1841. Here it is right here. It's a young 23-year-old with an afro. It's ex an extraordinary image. Following the publication of his best-selling autobiography in 1845, 
Douglas became famous at the very time that photography became immensely popular. So Douglas's trajectory as a public persona tracks the increasing popularity of photography. By 1850, there were photographic studios in every county, city, and territory in the free states. Virtually every northerner could afford to have his or her portrait taken. Engravings cut from these photographs circulated as frontispieces in books and in the illustrated press, which enabled readers to receive the news visually for the first time. Douglas's fame depended partly on photography, much as Matthew Brady's famous portrait of Lincoln in February of 1860 had helped elect him, as Douglas, Brady, and many others said. Let me unpack that uh, statement. On the morning that Lincoln gave his famous Cooper Union address in New York in 1860, he went for a photograph at Brady's studio. It's the first portrait of Lincoln that represents and that portrays him uh, respectably. It's the first time that he had a suit that actually fit him because his arms were so long. And this photograph then gets widely disseminated, mass produced as a, an engraving on the cover of Harper's Weekly. And why this is so significant and why Brady, him, Brady said uh, that Lincoln told him that this photograph elected him. Why? Because when Lincoln gave his Cooper Union address, Lincoln was virtually unknown in the East. He was a dark horse candidate. Few people knew him. Increasingly, people wanted to be able to know what their candidate looked like. And this image, after it, appe it appears twice in Harper's Weekly, it appears in Frank Leslie's, the two most widely circulated newspapers in the country. During the campaign, here's Lincoln, the same Brady portrait on a campaign button. It becomes ubiquitous in the campaign, and it helps people visually recognize Lincoln. Douglas associated photography with freedom. This was because the free states enjoyed a love affair with photography that surpassed that of every other nation on earth. And this is based on all available evidence. The American South, however, lacked the cities, roads, entrepreneurship, and other aspects of a capitalist infrastructure that enabled photography to flourish in the North. Moreover, in their efforts to defend slavery, Southerners vigorously suppressed freedoms of speech, debate, and the press, including photography and visual images. Douglas defined himself as a free man and citizen as much through his portraits as his words. His own freedom had coincided with the birth of photography, and he became one of its greatest boosters. The second reason for Douglass's love of photography is that he believed in its essential truth value or objectivity. Even more than truth telling, the truthful image represented abolitionists' greatest weapon, for it exposed slavery as a dehumanizing horror. Like slave narratives, and Douglass was a master of the genre, Photographic portraits bore witness to African Americans' essential humanity, while also countering the racist caricatures that proliferated throughout the North. Photographers themselves recognized that their medium lied like dogs. Many self-consciously manipulated the image, they solarized it, airbrushed out unwanted object or subjects, distorted it in other ways. But what's significant is that Douglas and most pa other patrons of the art believe that the camera told the truth. Even in the hands of racist whites, the camera created an authentic, truthful portrait and a work of art. Neither Douglas nor his peers recognize any contradiction between photography as an art and as a technology. The third reason for Douglass's love of photography is that it highlighted the essential humanity of its subjects. This was because of the medium's ability to make portraits for the millions. Here, Douglass was influenced by Aristotle, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thomas Carlyle. 
And he argued that humans' proclivity for pictures is what distinguished them from all other animals. To quote Douglas, man is the only picture-making animal in the world. He alone of all the inhabitants of earth has the capacity and passion for pictures. This is what made humans all equal in their humanity. Emphasizing the humanity of all humans was central to Douglass's reform vision. Most white Americans, after all, believed that blacks were innately inferior to whites, lacking in reason and rational thought. Most whites essentially thought blacks were subhuman, and many thought they were a separate inferior species, thus legitimizing slavery and uh, white supremacy. Many ethnologists, really the precursors of anthropologists, and other scientists argued that blacks had smaller craniums and brains than whites and thus lacked whites' cognitive abilities. In fact, there's a whole vogue of skull collecting among scientists in which they measured uh, the skulls supposedly of blacks and whites and came out with data saying that the skulls of blacks were smaller than those of whites. Douglas dismissed these scientist methods and the large scholar, quote unquote, scholarship that came out at the time. He dismissed it out of hand. He said, dogs and elephants are said to possess reason, but they lacked imagination, the realm of thought enabling humans to create pictures of themselves and their world. It's imagination that gives humans the ability to recognize themselves in the mirror, to seek to represent themselves in the world. The line separating humans from other animals was quite clear, Douglas emphasized. Man is everywhere a picture-making animal and the only picture-making animal in the world. And he called this picture-making power a sublime, prophetic, and all-creative power. The fourth reason for Douglass' love of photography is that it inspired people to eradicate the sins of their society. The power of imagination allowed people to appreciate pictures and photography specifically as accurate representations of some greater reality. It helped them try to realize their ideals in an imperfect world. As Douglass put it, Poets, prophets, and reformers are all picture makers. And this ability is the secret of their power. They see what is by the reflection of what ought to be and seek to remove the contradiction. Douglas considered himself all three, a poet, a prophet, and a reformer. And in fact, he did write poetry. So did most other abolitionists. Indeed, as a group, abolitionists and anti-slavery advocates, from Douglas and Lincoln to Whitman and Sojourner Truth, had their portraits taken with greater frequency, distributed them more effectively, and were more taken with photography than other groups. Photography inspired them to remove the contradictions between what ought to be and what is. Douglas's portraits and words sent a message to the world that he had as much claim to citizenship with the rights of equality before the law as his white peers. This is why he always dressed up for the photographer, appearing majestic in his wrath, as one admirer said of this portrait. And why he labored to speak and write with such eloquence. Douglas was widely considered one of, if not the greatest orators in the Civil War era, more eloquent even than Lincoln and Emerson. And it was through his images and words that he essentially out-citizened white citizens at a time when most blacks did not believe, I'm sorry, at a time when most whites did not believe that blacks should be citizens. Douglas made every effort to circulate his photographs. He shared them with absent family members and close friends. He gave them as gifts to new friends. He used them to garner subscriptions to his newspaper, thereby disseminating them further. And his photographs helped promote his talks. When he gave a talk, 
He sold photographs. His photographs appeared as frontispieces in his books. He used the three, marketed the three media together. But Douglas faced a problem in trying to disseminate his photographic portrait on a mass scale. The halftone process, which enabled photographs to be mass produced in newspapers and magazines, would not be perfected until the 20th century. So he relied instead on engravings cut from them. And here's an example. The photograph of Douglas with an engraving. And you see how accurate the engraving is uh, to the photograph. Engravers literally would trace the engraving, trace uh, the engraving from the photograph. And that's how they achieved that kind of accuracy. Douglas did not have the same faith in the objectivity of an engraver or a painter in general as he did of a photographer. The vast majority of whites, he said in one essay, could not create impartial likenesses of blacks because of their preconceived notions of what African Americans look like. But the camera overcame whites' preconceived notions of blacks. Even in the hands of racist whites, the camera represented blacks accurately. And he surmounted the problem of disseminating his photographs with the unreliable medium by using engravers and papers he trusted. John C. Butra was his preferred engraver. Here's Butra engraving. Uh, a, uh, the frontispiece of Douglass's best-selling My Bondage and My Freedom, his second autobiography. This is based on a photograph as well. It is also significant, highly significant, that Douglass and almost every other American treated engravings cut from photographs, such as this one and this one, as objective or authentic much as most people today interpret a half tone in the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street, Street Journal as truthful. In fact, I'm going to pose a question to you all here. How many in this room, when you see on the front page of the Post or the Times or the Journal a photograph, how many of you distrust the truth value of that photograph? No one. That's normal. I usually ask this question. At most, maybe in a crowd of 50, one person will raise their hand. We still believe in the truth value of the photograph, even though with the digital process especially, you can manipulate and distort an image to no end. The Illustrated Press, Harper's Weekly, Frank Leslie's engraving, referred to engravings cut from photographs in their pages as photographs rather than engraving from a photograph by, say, Matthew Brady. Whereas engravings from sketches in the Illustrated Press were simply called sketches, meaning an influence by the subjectivity of the artist. In other words, editors ignored the transfer process. They treat, treated the engraving from a photograph simply as a photograph. Through, through engravings cut from photographs, Douglas authorized millions of his portraits to be sent into the world. Now, with very few exceptions, these were public portraits designed to bolster Douglas's public persona. Most were studio portraits taken while he was on the road, but a few portray Douglas speaking or writing the arts for which he is best known and which he transformed. Despite the comparatively long exposure times, one photograph captures Douglas in mid-speech. Right here. He's at Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute, and it's in 1892, and possibly this is uh, Booker T. right there. A young Tuskegee, although I'm not entirely sure. Another early photograph, or another earlier photograph in 1850, depicts Douglas just after finishing a speech denouncing the fugitive slave law. Right here. 
There's Douglas. He's just finished his speech. It's in Casanova in New York, sorry. And uh, his friend, for, uh, Garrett Smith, is now giving a speech, gesticulating with his hands. This is an extraordinary photograph. So is the one of Douglas at Tuskegee Institute. Because the cameras were large and bulky, even though exposure times were reduced, so you could get a beautiful portrait in a studio, the, the, the smallest exposure time was still in the seconds. Whereas to get a, a, a vivid, detailed, crisp photograph of an order, you need fractions of a second. Those two photographs are truly uh, extraordinary. This photograph portrays the elder Douglas working at his desk, showing him writing. It's in uh, Anacostia. His dog is by him, his side there. His uh, violin, he was an accomplished violinist, is there, and his hat is right there. For Douglas, photography was not a personal memento or a means to visualize family relationships. In fact, there are no known photographs of Douglas with his first wife, Anna. The only photographs that function as, of, function as mementos of his immediate family are a newly discovered image of Douglas with his youngest daughter, Annie, from about 1853, in fact, I, we just discovered this uh, roughly a month ago, so it's not even in the book. It'll be in the second edition. In fact, we found several new images since the book came out. And this is the only known photograph of Annie. It's the only known photograph of Douglas sitting with an immediate family member, and Annie dies in 1859. Douglas, he, Douglas was emotionally very attached to her, and when she died, it was... A, it really crushed him. It was really traumatic for him. Here's an 18, another one of the few family portraits. Here's Douglas with his second wife, Helen, and her sister. Helen is on the right there. And then there's a photograph of Douglas, a honeymoon photograph of Douglas and Helen at Niagara Falls. This is a false facade. So they're not, it's a, a, a painting or a, uh, that's in the background, and you can see it by the manipulation there, which was common in studios. You put a false facade, so you're sitting at Niagara Falls. But they actually did go to Niagara Falls for their honeymoon, among other places. The sheer number of Douglas's public portraits conveys not only his faith in photography, but his understanding of the public identity he was crafting. By continually updating his public persona, he imagined the self as continually evolving in a state of constant flux, which exploded the very foundations of both slavery and racism. As you all know, of course, slavery creates a very low ceiling above which you cannot rise. And racism, among other things, is defined by the understanding that one group of people is permanently superior to another group of people. Again, it reflects a kind of fixity rather than flux or continual evolution. Douglas's fluid conception of the self unites art and politics. In fact, he went so far as to say that the moral and social influence of pictures was more important in shaping national culture than the making of its laws. That's an extraordinary statement. Essentially what Douglas is saying is that photographs, photography is more significant to changing America than Congress, than the president, than lawyers. Who photographed Douglas? He was inclusive or democratic in choosing photographers. The photographers comprised men and women, whites and blacks, southerners and northerners. And this diversity is partly owing to the fact that most of his portraits were taken on the road on speaking tours. Whenever he gave a speech in a new city, he'd stop at a photographic studio and sit for his portrait. The sheer number of different photographers reveals the comparative openness of the photographic profession. There were few barriers to entry for aspiring artist entrepreneurs. Startup costs 
were modest. It didn't cost a lot of money to acquire camera and the chemicals. It took only a few months with an instruction manual. You could learn the art of photography by yourself if you could read. And as a result, some of the leading photographers were women and blacks. Lydia Cadwell, an accomplished Chicago artist and entrepreneur, created these two stunning images of Douglas. Truly stunning, the, the texture and the detail in the profile and the frontal uh, portraits are, I think, extraordinary. Four black photographers portrayed him. Cornelius Batty photographed him in 1893 in New York City before becoming the instructor of photography at Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. Here's Batty's photograph of Douglas. James Reed formed an interracial partnership with Phineas Headley in New Bedford, Massachusetts, where Douglas had lived for three years as a fugitive. And in 1894, Reed and Headley created a beautiful portrait of the elder Douglas with his grandson, Joseph, who was a concert violinist. They had, Douglas had given a speech, his grandson, Joseph, had performed on the violin, and uh, Reed and Headley photographed them together after the event. James here in Easton from Rochester, Minnesota, photographed Douglas during a speaking tour through the Midwest in 1869, right here, the other, another black photographer. And James Presley Ball, who ran a famous Cincinnati studio, portrayed Douglas in two 1867 carte de visites right here. Gleason's Pictorial, which is the first illustrated press in the United States, featured Ball's gallery. Here's the African-American Cincinnati photographer. This is his gallery. Gleason's Pictorial featured it uh, in its pages. And this newspaper declared Ball, that Ball photographed with an accuracy and a softness of expression unsurpassed by any establishment in the Union. In other words, one of the most prestigious papers in the country is saying that the greatest American photographer is an African American at this time. Many of the nation's best known photographers also photographed Douglas. Matthew Brady, notice how Douglas's eyes kind of sparkle. John Howe Kent, George Kendall Warren, two different ones from Warren, and Alexander Gardner. Now Gardner inadvertently includes Douglas and John Wilkes Booth in his famous photograph of the second inaugural. Here's the second inaugural. Douglas is right here. I've circled him. Here's Lincoln delivering his address. It's basically a front row seat. And in fact, Douglas is invited to the second inaugural. He receives an invitation to go to the, um, to the uh, reception afterward at the White House. Uh, he enters. Uh, and he sees Lincoln in the elegant East Room, and Lincoln is surrounded by a crowd of whites, and Link Lincoln sees Douglas entering, and he raises his long arm, and he yells out, Hello, Mr. Douglas. I saw you in the crowd as I was delivering my address. What did you think of it? There is no man in these United States whose opinion I value more than yours. And Douglas responded to Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. So we know that Lincoln saw Douglas in the crowd. And then there's John Wilkes Booth up here and Lincoln delivering the speech there. Douglas recognized that his relationship with the camera and photographer contributed to the medium's power. His portrait suggests that he understood his role as an artist or performer as part of a pas de trois between himself, the photographer, and the camera. He acknowledged the challenges of sitting for a portrait. The photographic process, he said, was one of stern serenity, which tended to produce something statue-like in subjects. He confronted the challenge, much as a dancer did, by performing for the photographer, staying still during the exposure and appreciating the crucial role of timing, lighting, and set design. 
Douglas developed his own aesthetic. The majority of his portraits are closely cropped or vignetted. The effect draws attention to Douglas himself. There are comparatively few props to distract the viewer. He rejected the sentimental practice of using elaborate backdrops or painted scenes, such as landscapes. Such objects detracted from his solemn, dignified performance of a black man, demanding citizenship and equality before the law. When he used a prop, it was often significant. Lincoln's cane that Mary Todd Lincoln had given him after Lincoln's assassination as a token of Douglas's friendship with the president. There's Lincoln's cane. A book or a newspaper right there. And a chair with the arms carved into lions. There's the, the arms carved into lions. An acknowledgment of Douglas's own leonine mythology. He was often known as the Lion of Anacostia which is where he lived in a home in Cedar Hill for after the war for uh, most of his post-war years. Photographers sought Douglas out and apparently loved working with him. One friend owned more than 20 pictures of him and in 1870 said that the photographers are running after him to sit for, him, for them. Even now, save for a few isolated shots, Douglas's portraits consistently command our attention. Douglas's portraits, much like his persona as an orator and writer, continually evolved. The earliest three photographs suggest that he was exploring this new medium, searching for an appropriate pose or visual voice. In the first known image, the daguerreotype from around 1841, Douglas appears somewhat statue-like, as he would have said. No doubt this was partly because exposure times in 1841 lasted several minutes as opposed to several seconds a few years later. In an 1843 daguerreotype, the camera is positioned at the level of his chest and he looks up or beyond to one side. This was the pose recommended by photographic manuals. It was a visionary gaze, a look evoked by statesmen or men of eminence. But Douglas was still a fugitive and not yet comfortable with his visual persona. In this daguerreotype, his eyes seem only half open and partially shrouded in shadow, especially his right eye, or what we see as his right eye, thus complicating a visionary gaze. In an 1848 daguerreotype by the Edward White Gallery, he looks askance with his head down, as if unwilling to trust the camera or the photographer. These are the first three images. And these three, first three images indicate a certain uncertainty about Douglass's 1840s visual persona. Such uncertainty is also reflected in an 1846 letter to a fu fellow fugitive in which Douglass writes, I got real low in spirits a few days ago, quite down at the mouth. I looked so ugly that I hated to see myself in the glass. It's an extraordinary statement because, among other things, one of the central facts of Douglas as a subject, as a photographic subject, is his handsomeness. He was considered handsome, majestic then, and he is now today. What Douglas sought was a look that could lay claim for himself and other blacks to respect and dignity. In essence, the right of citizenship a visual voice of democracy. And this is what photography offered him and other African Americans and other people. Douglas seems to have found that look around 1850 in a daguerreotype right here. He stares sternly into the camera lens in a dramatic and crafted pose. It sent a message of artful defiance or majestic wrath. And with minor variations, it became his visual voice from 1850 through the Civil War. The frontispiece of his best-selling second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, based on a daguerreotype now lost, resembles the 1850 daguerreotype and similarly evokes artful defiance. It, too, draws attention to his physical strength and aggression, depicting, as it does, a broad-shouldered young man 
in a pugilistic pose with furrowed brows and firm lips. Owing to the extraordinary popularity of my bondage and my freedom, this photograph or this portrait of Douglas was probably the most widely disseminated uh, portrait of him in America until after the Civil War. In the 1850s, Douglas began fashioning for himself another even more dramatic pose, the profile portrait. It was limited chiefly to distinguished men and women, and it generally evoked majesty rather than defiance. In the antebellum era, there are only five known profile portraits of Douglas. In one, from around 1855, his, his fists are clenched, suggesting a look of majestic defiance. In the 1870s, after he became a distinguished statesman, the profile portrait became one of his favorites. Among the 164 distinct poses, three central themes stand out. First, he almost never showed a smile, with the notable exception of an 1894 cabinet card six months before he died, right here. Almost to the end of his life, he refuted the racist caricatures of blacks as happy slaves and servants. Second, he presented himself in dress, pose, and expression as a dignified and respectable citizen. Third, his visual persona continually evolved, which undermined the foundations of slavery and racism. Over the years, from revolutionary freedom fighter and steely visionary to wise prophet and elder statesman. Perhaps the most noticeable visual marker of Douglass's continual evolution is in his facial hair. While 19th century men experimented with hair sweet faces, few did so as frequently as Douglass. He tracked and often led the prevailing fashion. In the 1840s, a clean shaven look was most prevalent, writes Joan Severa, who's work on um, fashion in the 19th century is extraordinary. And Douglas, too, was clean shaven in his earliest images. He grew chin whiskers in the early 1850s. You can see the chin whiskers right there. That evolved into a crop fringe of mutton chop whiskers along the chin and the jawline, which was also a trend at the time. There's the, uh, the mutton chop whiskers. By the mid-1850s, he became a trendsetter with a full beard coupled with side hair that covered his ears, a look that was not popular until late in the decade. Here's his full beard. He then began sporting a goatee, which he kept until about 1863. In January 1864, he anticipated another trend with a sporty walrus mustache, right there, which would not become common for another two decades. And around 1865, he coupled his walrus mustache with a short ponytail. You can see the ponytail right back there. He kept his mustache until about 1873, at which point he briefly grew a full beard. There's his full beard. Within a year, however, he shaved his chin whiskers while retaining bushy sideburns that looped up to connect to his mustache, right there. And in 1875, he maintained a neatly groomed full beard, anticipating a look affected by authority figures in the 1880s. His beard and hair gradually lengthened and whitened until his death in 1895. Here's an image, a, a post-mortem image taken a few hours after Douglas died. And you, whoops, and you see uh, the full beard. The evolution of his appearance, like his portraits, indicates his status as a self-made man. The appellation encapsulates Douglass's rise up from slavery, his abolitionism, his love of photography, and his faith that true art could break down racial barriers. 
Self-made men became for Douglas one of his signature speeches in a key word denoting not riches, but reformers who sought to eradicate the sins of their society as they evolved. So it's a very different definition than what we think of it to, as today. It's not about getting rich. It's about reforming your society as you evolve. After Lincoln's first meeting with Douglas at the White House, the president called Douglas one of the most meritorious men, if not the most meritorious man in these United States, essentially saying he was a self-made man. It was the highest compliment one could receive at the time. Douglas's portrait gallery contributed to this persona as one of the nation's preeminent self-made men. In certain respects, it resembled the nation. Both Douglas and the nation had come out from slavery and revolution to become respected statesmen or state. Then, too, Douglas and his nation were both aspirational. They saw what ought to be by the reflection of what is. And, of course, the Declaration of Independence was aspirational. But unlike Douglas, most American statesmen did not seek to remove the contradiction between what was and what ought to be. While Douglas's portrait gallery was all embracing, America's was narrow and petty. It continued to define itself as white and male. As a result, Douglas's portraits have served as an important visual legacy in the 20th and 21st centuries, inspiring art that could break down racial barriers. Douglas took advantage of his new technology in much the same way that social activists today take advantage of our new technology and photos and countless examples of home without a camera. Why? They understand what Douglas emphasized 150 years ago, the camera's tr uh, truth value and the power that comes from it. Douglas's portraits connected past to present in another way as well. They summoned artists to create thousands of murals, sculptures, paintings, prints, drawings, postage stamps, magazine covers based on Douglas's photographs. Douglas's visual legacy protested lynching and segregation. It lobbied for civil rights and celebrated black power. It dignified the black body that white Americans, according to Ta-Nehisi Coates, have so often tried to destroy. And let me just give you a sample, a very brief sample of the many different legacy uh, images of Douglas based on the photographs. Uh, this is uh, the sculpture by Richard Blake, inspired by the 1852 daguerreotype, which I showed earlier. On the left is a uh, Washington, D.C. mural, unfortunately destroyed in 2002 because the building was torn down. Uh, and Douglas in uh, L.A. on a mural also based on a, uh, a relatively early uh, daguerreotype. Here's one of two Douglas posted stamps based on the carte de visite. Notice how the artist in the posted stamps has his hand pointing up, whereas in the photograph it's pointing down. It's an anti-racism mural in Belfast, Northern Ireland, based on the Matthew Brady card of Azit. And this mural in Belfast, Northern Ireland is the largest mural in the city. You can't avoid seeing it. It's really extraordinary. Douglas spent a lot of time in Ireland. He loved it. There's a close correlation between the Irish and Douglas and their similar reform efforts. Similar mur mural in New Bedford. Uh, focusing on labor and uh, improving, uh, reforming uh, labor conditions uh, from 2001. And uh, one that still exists in Washington, D.C., uh, Bread for the City on Good Hope Road, which is a beautiful uh, mural based on the 1858 daguerreotype. Douglass's awareness of the possibilities of imagery to shape public opinion, the attempt by America's first black celebrity to control and circulate his own image, launched one of the great battles in American history. 
a battle between racist stereotypes and dignified individuals. Across 50 years of photographs, Douglas fought for the public image of African Americans. Across the next 120 years, in his visual afterlife, the photographs have fought on. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments, criticisms? First of all, I'd like to say this is truly a fascinating presentation. I had no idea this was part of uh, Frederick Douglass' uh, life and legacy. Yeah. Just a couple of questions. He, uh, as a result of the John, failure of the John Brown raid, he escaped right. to Europe. Right. I'm just curious, during that period, um, I know that he, was, he was accepted in Europe, particularly in England, yeah. and I'm just wondering, oh, are there photos uh, associated with his his uh, residence in uh, England um, that are you know, currently available, uh, yeah. and did he use it to politicize uh, his anti-slavery yes. uh, sentiment? The other question I have is that during the Civil War and after the Civil War, photography was used by, a, um, I guess, basically uh, organizations that were soliciting Northern liberals for uh, funds to support the, um, the organization and development of schools and education for African Americans. Right. I'm just curious, um, and many of them use f uh, photographs, so I guess out of that strategy, I assume that that was similar to what uh, Frederick Douglass did in terms of using photography yes. for social movements. Yes, yes, so th the second question, that, that's exactly right. In fact, Douglass contributed his portrait to helping to raise money for uh, black African-American schools uh, throughout the country. So in other words, if you give money, if you give a certain amount of money for the school, you get a portrait of Douglas. <laughs> and he authorized this. Uh, that was one of many ways in which he circulated his image to uh, raise money. Uh, and one of many ways. In, before the Civil War, uh, he offered, uh, if you subscribe to his newspaper, you would receive a photograph. Uh, during an anti-slavery fair for the American Anti-Slavery Society, if you gave money to the American Anti-Slavery Society, you'd get a beautiful daguerreotype. And daguerreotypes, tintypes, and ambrotypes are unique one-of-a-kind objects, unlike uh, the card de visites and the cabinet cards. So those were really valuable. As to your first question, it's a great question. It's been a huge puzzle for me, and that is, only since the book came out have we discovered the very first photograph of Douglas in Europe, in England, Ireland, or Scotland. And I calculated, you know, from 1841 until 1895, Douglas, on average, sat for his photograph every other month. Mm -hmm. Every other month, Douglas had another photograph taken. And yet, he's in England, Ireland, and Scotland for two years from 1845 to 1847, another six months, as you point out, after the John Brown raid. And then he and his second wife, Helen, go to Europe for two a year and a half. And we've only found one photograph. Hmm. Why is that? Um, I think there are more are going to come out of the woodwork. One of the, the differences is that it was much easier for us to scour all of the because they tend to be uh, better um, digitized and so you can contact a curator or a director of an archive and they can look through their uh, list and say yes we own X number of photographs or no we don't. We've, there have been a couple that we found since the book came out where a photograph is in a file that they didn't, that they didn't recognize. Um, and, but in Europe, in England, Ireland, Scotland, and France, and European countries, there's not that same systematic effort to document everything in the archive. And so when you go there and so you ask a curator, do you, know, do you have any photographs of Douglas? Well, I don't know. You're just going to have to come and look through everything that we have. <laughs> and we didn't have the capacity to do that. We did as much as we could. Um, so that's one 
part of the answer. The second part, and this relates to England or Great Britain, and it's really unusual. Henry Fox Talbot was one of the co-inventors of photography. He created the it was called a Talbot type. It was the really negative to positive process. It's a precursor of the modern photograph, whereas daguerreotype, it was a unique one of a kind uh, image, uh, silver oxide on, on uh, copper. Um, and he's a Frenchman. And Henry Fox Talbot, the British, was an aristocrat. And what's interesting about British photography, despite the democratic nature of the photograph, is that British photographers and aficionados tended to be almost exclusively upper class. And as a result, there wasn't nearly the kind of storefront studios where you could walk in off the street and have your portrait taken. It just it was really a, a medium, an art form that was for the upper class. So you think of Roger Fenton, who uh, photographed the Crimean War. Uh, and in fact, in an essay, I suggest that Fenton um, in the Crimean War uh, create the, the first uh, living room war followed by the Civil War. Fenton was a huge aristocrat. His images, uh, when you had an exhibition, they were attended by elites. They did not attract, they almost tried to exclude the lower classes almost. Uh, Douglas did spend some time in France and in terms of the popularity of photography, I said that the U.S. had a love affair. and There's more photographs in the U.S. than US Americans had a love affair in the free states that surpassed that of every other nation. In ranking, the best we know is that U.S. is one, France is two, uh, Prussia, or what's now Germany, would be three, and England would be, at, at best, four. And so that would be another reason. But it's still a conundrum given how frequently Douglas sat for his photograph and how, you know, he's in, he's in the British Isles for over two years. And so far we've only found one. That doesn't make sense to me. At least I think I'm hoping that a few more will be uncovered. Yes. Uh, thank you, of course, for such a wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, you talked... Uh, about how Douglas himself wrote about the importance of the democratic nature of photography and uh, spoke about it. I was wondering, well, maybe, maybe uh, easily portable cameras came after he, uh, uh, he died, but I was wondering, did he himself practice the art of that's photography? And do we have those photographs? Yes, I'd be interested in seeing some of those. That's a great question. So, um, the short answer is there's no evidence, no strong evidence that Douglas uh, himself was a photographer. I should say that uh, photography at this time, when I mentioned it took several months to learn the process, it was the age before the snapshot. The brownie camera, Kodak brownie camera, created the snapshot and it made photography accessible to everyone. In fact, the Brownie camera advertised, their slogan was, you push the button, we do the rest. They sent you a box cameras, the smallest cameras, about the apes long by this big. The film was already in, and all you had to do was press the button. You send the whole camera back to Kodak. They take the film out, they develop and print it, and they send you prints, and they reload your camera for you. You don't have to do any of the, any of the process. And that's 1890s, and yeah. it's really not perfected until... 1900. So with that, so Twain, for example, Mark Twain is a generation younger. There are a lot more photographs of Twain than of Douglas, but most of them are after the Brownie camera creates and um, makes snapshots available so that anyone can become a photographer. Uh, before the Brownie camera, the cameras were big, large format cameras. They had to be set on a tripod. Uh, it took... Um, as I said, three to a few months, generally three to six months. But that's just starting out. Most photographers, it wasn't until a year in where they really perfected uh, the medium and uh, could really create portraits that I would call works of art in terms of understanding lighting. It was, you know, they didn't have, no, there's no such thing as a light meter. There's no such thing as going to the store, yeah, I want a developer and a fixer and photographic paper. You had to make your own photographic paper. You had to create your own developer and your own fixture. You had to buy all the chemicals. 
And each photographer had a little different or developed a little different chemical process. Understanding chemical, uh, how, how uh, under, have, having some knowledge of chemistry was very helpful. And so that said, Douglas was uh, uh, so in love with photography, he started learning the process which is really extraordinary given how productive he was as a writer in order. He still took time out and he learned the process. We, there's no evidence that he actually photographed it. In one archive, we found photographs there, uh, vistas of um, nature vistas, trees and shrubs. We don't know if they're from Douglas, but they're in the same box as other material from Douglas. And in fact, Zoe, my co-author, one of the two co-authors, you know, thinks they're Douglas's photographs. But you know, I said, you know, where, show me the evidence for this. <laughs> There's no evidence. Yeah. So yeah, it'd be wonderful to find a photograph that Douglas actually took, but it'd really be hard to document. So it's a great question. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for the lecture and for the book. I heard about the book three years ago or so, and I've been looking forward to it. Oh, so, where did you hear about the book well, from? It was uh, at a lecture at the Smithsonian. It was uh, a professor from Dartmouth or somewhere who said he was a friend of yours, actually. Bob Levine? Probably. I'm not quite. I don't remember, okay, but okay, that, okay. that's where I heard about okay. it. My question is this, or comment. Um, of the African-American leaders today, or uh -huh. in the past 50 years or so, including King, and Jesse Jackson, let's say, and some striking photographic figures. Uh, did you look at how they use photography as compared to Douglas, or did they learn anything from Douglas? And just, just would you comment on that? I yeah, yeah, it's a question. great question. Yeah. So I, um, I don't in this book. I do have another essay where I do look at that. And uh, so one of the differences between Americans understand, well, African Americans understanding of photography in the 19th century and the 20th century, and I would say Americans in general, is that um, Douglas and his peers, black and white, had more faith in the truth value or the objectivity of the camera than did Du Bois or Booker T. Washington or Martin Luther King Jr. And it coincides with the rise of photography as an art form separated from technology. So what I said in the talk and in the book is that in the 19th century, people recognized photography both as an art and as a technology. And there was no contradiction between the two. It could be an accurate technology and an art, and there's no contradiction. By the 20th century, in the early 20th century, the understanding of art changes so that if it's a technology, it cannot be an art. And so one of Alfred Stieglitz's greatest contribution to photography is to convince people that photography is an art form as worthy of painting and sculpture and thus as worthy of being in a museum or collecting as these other fine arts. And in order to do that, his idea of pictorialism is to borrow from the painterly tradition. And so his, his pictorious, pictorialist, Stieglitz, the early Stieglitz, um, and uh, many of the other photographers, they manipulated the prints, so they wanted their photographs to almost look like paintings. So Du Bois, in the early 20th century, in fact, he understood the power of photography in uh, 1900, he curated an exhibition in Paris of African Americans in Georgia photographed by an African American photographer uh, that was widely seen in Paris. And they, like Douglas, all of the subjects were well dressed, uh, demanding their rights as equal citizens. And it, it, was, it actually was one of the things that led to Du Bois' uh, famous Souls of Black Folk. And in his magazine, The Crisis, in 1912, I think it was, he wrote an essay on photography. And really, in his essay, he encouraged African Americans to become photographers. Because he said, we cannot trust white photographers. In other words, Du Bois did not have the same faith in the truth value of the camera 
that Douglas and his peers did, whether it's Sojourner Truth or Harriet Tubman or others. Du Bois said, if you put a camera in the hands of a white man, it will distort the objectivity. Whereas Douglas said, you put a camera in the hands of a racist white, and the camera will not lie. So Du Bois wanted more black photographers to be able to represent and portray uh, African Americans with the dignity and uh, equal humanity and citizenship that Douglas saw, whether it was white or black. And Booker T. Washington went a step further. Wa Booker T. had a brilliant sense of the power of the visual image. Booker T. Washington had two full-time photographers on staff. He had a white photographer who photographed him for the white press and a black photographer who photographed him for the black press. And that's how he understood the difference. Now, um, Martin Luther King Jr. In the, also recognized the difference between white and black photographers. Part of that difference also reflected the change in the technology of the camera. In Douglas's day and in the 19th century, I said that they're large format cameras which means that the tonal range from the white whites to the black backs are, black blacks are incredibly rich. Um, the, the, the subtlety and richness of the tones um, in the 19th century could not, be, um, uh, uh, could not be achieved in the 20th century with the small handheld and especially film cameras. In Douglas's day, it was either you know, the, the, the negative, so to speak, was a glass plate, a large glass plate, where they contact print, the print onto it. In the 20th century, the negatives were increasingly small, and then you expand it. You don't get that beautiful subtlety of tonal range. So that was one of the differences. Nevertheless, Martin Luther King Jr. recognized the power of photography in his uh, civil rights movement. And in fact, one Southern photo, white Southern photojournalist had covered uh, SNCC and King's movement for seven or eight years in the South. He was a photojournalist from uh, Georgia. And he asked, after doing so for several years, for a private meeting with King. And King granted, and he said, I've been, I'm a complete convert to your movement. I want to quit my job as a photojournalist and join your movement and do whatever I can. What should I do? And King responded, the best thing you can do for us is to continue doing exactly what you've been doing. Remain a photojournalist, photograph us sympathetically, and make sure those images are disseminated widely. In fact, in the civil, the, the iconic photographs of the civil rights movement, they were shown on the national news, in the national press, in the international press. But the southern towns in which those photographs appeared didn't even disseminate them, didn't show them, because it highlighted the way in which whites were trying to dehumanize blacks. They were brilliant protest images for equal rights. So most southern communities ignored the television footage and the photographic footage of civil rights marches and confrontations with whites. Does that answer your question? We're out of time. Okay. Thank you very much. That was a great question. <laughs>